Well, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to the next session. What will unlock the next wave of growth in China? Uh, my name is Rick New. I'm the founder and CEO of Nexus Worldwide. Sitting next to, my next, uh, to me is uh, Bonnie Chan, who is the CEO of Hong Kong Exchange. Mei Gao, IDG Global Partner. Andrew He, founder and CIO of Nels Capital. Mr. Nicholas uh, Ho, who's going to give us a keynote speech momentarily, is the commissioner of Belt and Road for the Hong Kong government. And Jun Sun Park, who's a co-CIO of Legend Capital. Without further ado, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Distinguished guest, it's a real pleasure to be here at FII panel today and share my observations and aspirations for the next wave of growth in China. When we discuss growth, we must differentiate between cyclical and structural growth. Cyclical growth is influenced by transient factors such as prevailing sentiments, interest rate fluctuations, fiscal stimulus, so on. In contrast, structural growth stems from the sustained and optimal utilization of an economy's inherent endowments. This is where policymakers must focus their attention. So today, I'll emphasize on the critical factors that will unlock the next wave of structural growth in China. Over the past several decades, China has achieved extraordinary economic transformation since its opening up in 1979. This has been driven by active engagement in the global value chain, leveraging its abundant labor supply and rising productivity of its workforce, what is what we called as the demographic dividend. There are growing challenges regarding the sustainability of this model. First, companies worldwide are diversifying their supply chains. Second, the cost of production within China is rising. It is a challenge to continue with the low cost production model and a declining birth rate also put pressure on the labor supply. Third, the technology gap between China and the rest of the world is narrowing rapidly. That said, while China's demographic dividend may be reducing, there's no cause for alarm. In fact, quite the opposite. Foreign direct investment remains extremely robust according to UNCTAD World Investment Report in 2024. China was the world's second largest recipient of FDI inflows, attracting 160 billion in 2023 for the third consecutive year. Moreover, it was the third largest source of outward FDI inflows with $140 billion in 2023, maintaining top three position for 12 consecutive years. This demonstrates that China continues to play a significant role in global value chain. Furthermore, China's population remains huge. The nation is also making significant strides in robotics, with many labor-intensive tasks now being handled by advanced automation. Crucially, China is pivoting its focus rather than primarily relying on imported foreign technology and basic labor, China is embracing the concept of high quality development. This approach prioritizes innovation as the driving force behind growth, emphasizing that future development must be coordinated, green, open, and inclusive. Addressing today's topic, the next wave of growth in China will be propelled by high quality development, particularly through green initiatives and innovation. On green development, China has emerged as the world's largest clean energy investor. According to IEA estimates for 2024, China will invest a staggering $826 billion in clean energy, contributing to one fifth of China's GDP growth. In contrast, the US and EU ranked as the second and third largest clean energy investor with $497 billion and $446 billion respectively. This means China's investment represents 88%
of the combined efforts of the US and EU. Through forward-thinking green investments, we can reduce the cost associated with environmental degradation, fostering sustainable growth and development. As the benefits of these investments materialized, improved worker health, lowered health care costs, and enhanced energy efficiency, the next wave of growth will undoubtedly be unlocked. When we discuss innovation-driven growth, we must acknowledge that while quantifying innovation can be complex, the impact is undeniable. Consider two distinct types of innovation-driven growth. The first is the type of businesses that simply did not exist before. A global drone industry leader was founded in 2006. Prior to this inception, the drone market was virtually non-existent. Fast forward to 2023, and the low altitude economy in China was valued at a staggering $70 billion, marking a remarkable 34% increase year on year. This sector is not only just beginning to soar, having grown 30% compared to the previous year. In less than two decades, China has catalyzed the emergence of entire industry from the ground up. The second type of innovation-driven growth is the industries where China is now breaking grounds on. The innovative drug sector is a prime example. Historically, China's strength lay in drug manufacturing. But in recent years, the innovative drugs industry has experienced explosive growth. In 2023, the market for innovative drugs reached $100 billion. And this figure could even be larger if we account for out-licensing abroad. There are countless examples, from nuclear technology to batteries, underscoring this transformative model. In the context of high-quality development, Hong Kong stands out as a super connector and a super value adder. Regarding green development, Hong Kong possesses a comprehensive value chain that integrates green standards, finance, and technology, all interconnected with mainland of China and the rest of the world. In May this year, Hong Kong introduced the Hong Kong Taxonomy for Sustainable Finance, providing a clear framework that aligns with the Common Ground Taxonomy, China's Green Bond Endorsed Projects Catalog, and the European Union's Taxonomy for Sustainable Activities. This framework encompasses 12 economic activities across four sectors, power generation, transportation, construction, water and waste management. According to IEA statistics, power generation accounts for 48% of carbon emissions in mainland, followed by industry at 36%, transport at 8%, and buildings at 5%. With the introduction of the Hong Kong taxonomy, we addressed over 60% of the mainland's carbon emissions. Not only does Hong Kong feature globally competitive green standards, but these standards are also inherently linked to green finance. Standards, interoperability, and alignment drives global public and private investments, which in turn propel economic development and integration. The HKSAR government's initiative to promote sustainable finance have resulted in significant market growth, with green and sustainable debt issuance in Hong Kong exceeding 50 billion US dollars in 2023. Notably, Hong Kong ranked first in Asia for the volume of green and sustainable bonds issuance, making up 37% of the total. Today, as we stand here at this important moment in time, when the global landscape is continuously in flux, one thing is clear. We must innovate. This is where Hong Kong plays a pivotal role serving as a powerhouse of innovation. Take the drone industry leader, for example. As I mentioned earlier, its founder graduated from the University of Science and Technology in Hong Kong. According to the 2025 QS World University Ranking, five Hong Kong universities ranked among the world's top 100, with the University of Hong Kong standing at 17th. This makes Hong Kong the city 
with the highest concentration of top-tier universities globally. Additionally, renowned research institutions such as the Karolinska Institute, which oversees the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, have established research centers in Hong Kong, with 16 states' key laboratories and 29 inner Hong Kong centers, collaborative research initiatives linking Hong Kong's universities with world-class institutions. This concentration of expertise has the potential to drive transformation and commercialize research outcomes across the globe. Hong Kong's contribution to high-quality development is immense. According to the Economic Freedom of the World Report 2027, published by the Fraser Institute just two weeks ago, Hong Kong ranks as the number one world's freest economy among 165 economies. In closing, although we find ourselves amid a magnitude of challenges, global conflicts, economic challenges, and climate change, Hong Kong stands out, if you will, as the golden key in unlocking the next wave of regional growth in China, along the Belt and Road, and beyond. I firmly believe that cooperation is the only viable solution. Forums like today's exemplify this collaborative spirit bringing together diverse cultures for a shared mission, shaping a positive, collective future. Only through working together can we unlock the full potential of the opportunities that lies ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Great opening about Hong Kong, about China, as part of the Belt and Road efforts. Uh, as all of you know, there's a special relationship being formed between the great territory of Hong Kong and this uh, great nation, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, let's move on to the next segment of the Q&A. Uh, I have um, this lineup of wonderful key opinion leaders here. Bonnie, let me start with you. Sure. Speaking of the outside perspectives about China, I noted recently the International Monetary Fund actually adjusted China's uh, GDP growth forecast for this year. Now, part of the background is that many of the developed economies actually are trending down uh, with all of their macroeconomic issues here. So why do you think the IMF actually took this uh, move? And uh, with that big picture in mind, what are some of the long-term great potential investment opportunities for the global community? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I don't think I can speak on behalf of IMF. I don't understand the methodology but the second biggest cluster of unicorns. Um, and one area, I know we're short of time, right, that I think everyone should really focus on, it's green transitioning. Now, I know there's a lot of debate about overcapacity. China's leading in the space of EVs, solar panels, batteries, etc., And the technology is very advanced. However, you know, if we think about or if we really think about the question of whether or not there's overcapacity, I will tell you this. If you set aside you know, those EVs which are consumed within China, China's supply to the world, the rest of the world, it's only a single digit percentage of total world's consumption of EV these days. So my question to the audience is, if all the countries around the world are serious about achieving net zero, carbon emission by 2050, 2060, how are they going to do that? Okay, found in the space like EV solar panels, and that is an area I think we should continue to, to see a lot of growth coming out. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, May, uh, you live in New York, but let me ask you uh, a question from within China. Um, you know, China's leadership has highlighted a shift towards something called new quality productive force as really a cornerstone of economic strategy and frankly, new agenda going forward. What exactly does that term mean? And what are the key challenges, opportunities you see associated with this new quality productive force? Thank you, Rick. Uh, that's really a great question. And I think it really ties into the theme of this conference, uh, Infinite Horizons, investing today and shaping uh, tomorrow. China is transitioning from a fixed investment-led growth model into an innovation 
consumption-led economy. And as Bonnie and Nicolas uh, mentioned, it really opens up uh, exciting investment opportunities for impactful, sustainable future. And we're already seeing some of those already. Nicolas mentioned that uh, China invested over 800 billion in green energy transition, and it really helps to lower the cost of uh, renewable energy for the world. Yeah, so we at IDG, we're one of the earliest uh, investors uh, in the green energy sector. And over the years, we have invested uh, over 1.5 billion US dollars in the sector. And collectively, these investments have lowered carbon emission by 15 million tons on an annual basis. We're also helping our entrepreneurs to expand globally, and the GCC region is one of their favorite destinations. And this has a lot to do with the region's the commitment to green energy transition, and uh, especially here in Saudi Arabia under the Saudi uh, 2030 vision. So based, uh, based on these initiatives, we recently a partner with the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, in the region to set up a mega factory to produce uh, green energy equipment, bringing our expertise and know-how and create uh, local jobs. And in fact, after the last FII, one of our portfolio companies uh, announced a partnership with one of PIF's uh, subsidiaries. This is a perfect example of the FII's vision of uh, breaking boundaries and fostering global uh, cooperation. So I think it, by uh, investing in the region, in the GCC region, we're not only supporting our entrepreneurs' growth, we're also demonstrating that innovation can really bring a uh, shared prosperity. Back to you. Thank you, May. I appreciate that. Jun, welcome. Thank uh, you. You're from South Korea, but you have chosen a number of years ago to actually work for a legendary company called Legend, no puns intended, in, uh, in China. So let me ask you a fairly Chinese question here, given your background. Um, as May and uh, uh, Bonnie both have mentioned, China has really become a powerhouse for advanced manufacturing. But at the same time, also a major concern as perceived by the rest of the world uh, as a source of global overcapacity. How do you think this will evolve? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chun Song Park from South Korea. I've been working for Chinese venture capital for the last 20 years. Uh, I think there's a lot of debate about overcapacity, also the tech war between US and China. Uh, so our strategy is to find a company that can replicate its success model outside of their home market. So we've been investing in Korea. Uh, we've invested uh, 18 companies. We have three companies in Japan. And in Korea, for example, we invested a very popular boy band group called BTS. Uh, we invested that Asian group. Also, we invested in a virtual YouTuber company in Japan called AnyColor, uh, which is one of the most successful IPO in Japan two years ago. What I want to emphasize is we want to find a company in each region that can scale their business outside of their home market. And back to your question, when it comes to China, I think China is very unique in the sense that they have a huge engineer talent. So every year they have more than 2 million engineer talents graduating every year. Also, the government and the companies are very committed to make a lot of expenditure in R&D. So we invested an uh, EV battery company called CATL back in 2016. When we invested, Panasonic from Japan was actually dominating the market. But fast forward eight years from now, uh, CATL is now taking about 35% of the total market share, followed by BYD. So uh, what I want to emphasize is China uh, is really good at manufacturing and also bringing all these nurturing AI talents. So although there's an overcapacity issue, I think in terms of competitive edge, China is uh, none to second, I think, in the world. So I'm pretty confident that there's a lot of investment opportunities when it comes to these advanced technology sectors. Thank you, Jun. Andrew, let's uh, move over to you. First of all, thank you for being on the panel and making me feel like a senior citizen. I appreciate that. Um, let me ask you about um, uh, Jun's point of view. Do you agree with him? As you know, for years, China's integration into global trade really fueled up to a third of the global economic growth, uh, really benefiting the entire world from a demand perspective. Do you think this will change, and why do you think so? Thank you, Rick. Uh, it's an honor to be here. 
Um, I, I, uh, generally, I agree with June. Uh, I think uh, we all, as we know, uh, globalization and te technology are the two uh, fundamental forces to drive economic growth for the entire world, in, in which sense I believe China will continue to contribute. Uh, firstly, for uh, globalization, um, many would think, would, 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 would uh, misread uh, a few signals these, uh, in recent years to conclude that China is probably closing up its economy or uh, prioritizing national security over uh, economic growth, but in, when actually indeed uh, it is the opposite. If we carefully read the 22,000 word uh, report of the, uh, the third uh, plenary session of uh, CPC, uh, 20th CPC Central Conference, uh, our committee, which is uh, considered the uh, most important policy document in every five years for reforms and economic uh, policy making, you will find that uh, the length of discuss discussing uh, economic issues uh, takes up over 40% uh, this, uh, this time. In comparison, in the uh, last equivalence five years ago, it, it was only 10%. And you will see uh, a lot of uh, positive words got frequently mentioned uh, uh, com in comparison to the last equivalence. So uh, I, I'm trying to say that, um, um, and also uh, astonishingly, the chapter that was supposed to uh, address the Taiwan issue in the last equivalence got entirely eliminated this time uh, to make room for the economic issues, which is meant to send out a big signal that uh, to the world that China is still prioritizing economic high quality development, as Bonnie said, uh, over all, all, all else above. So that's very uh, essential signal. And as for, uh, consequentially, we see a lot of, this year we've been seeing uh, a lot of uh, policy movements to further open up the economy uh, for international investors, corporates, or even travelers uh, this year. And of course, since the late September, we see massive fiscal and monetary uh, measures to stim stimulate the economy and capital market. So, and as for the uh, technology front, uh, let me just uh, please allow me to quickly uh, show you a few uh, very interesting uh, numbers. First, uh, as June mentioned, uh, with people retiring and uh, kids graduating from college every year, there are over 10 million people with college degrees in China every year entering the labor market, 35% of which hold uh, degrees from uh, STEM majors, which definitely translates into, uh, and this will keep happening for the next 10 years, which definitely will translate into uh, more affordable human capitals for engineers and R&D personnel. And um, this, this phenomenon has never, is unprecedented in the human history. Um, second of all, uh, the, um, uh, the second is uh, uh, there are 27% of the academic papers published by top journals in science and technology around the world are from, uh, actually from mainland China. And there are 45, 40, sorry, 48% of patent granted by the top five patent IP offices around. Uh, Andrew, uh, thank you for those statistics. We have to get going. Oh, right, right, right. So, yes. uh, really quick for another uh, round of uh, questions here. Bonnie, moving to the world at large, I know we think about this every day, running Asia's second largest uh, stock exchange. Uh, the geopolitical landscape is increasingly complex and difficult. How can business and finance and investing leaders here contribute to a future of shared prosperity rather than fragmentation and distrust, you think? Well, that's a difficult question, but at least I think we should focus on something that we can agree on. Uh, I think these days it's not easy. Um, there is more disagreement in the world than agreement. But like I said earlier, perhaps we share one planet. So green transitioning and things that we can do to foster that could be one thing that we should all prioritize and, and uh, hopefully we make progress together. So that would be my answer. Oh, that, I will vote for you on that one. Um, <laughs> May, back on China, the recent policy moves have sparked curiosity among a lot of people here about a potentially significant fiscal stimulus. 
However, others suggest that China's already very high level of leverage may actually constrain its capacity to borrow further actually do this. What is your view on this? That's a great question, and it really cuts to the heart of the debate. If you look at Chinese government, that uh, local and central government together is around 70 percent of GDP. Uh, but if you add on the local government financing vehicle, that goes to 130 percent, which is comparable to a lot of the advanced economy. Uh, but there is another side of the story, because the Chinese government does have a lot of assets. According to a working paper by the IMF, uh, the IMF said that Chinese government's holding in equity alone uh, is worth 12.5 trillion US dollars, about 68% of the GDP. In fact, in the same paper, IMF mentioned that uh, the Chinese government's net worth, that's uh, asset minus liabilities, is about 7% of GDP in 2019, and that's a pretty good position to be in. And China is also in a unique situation of uh, being the creditor to the world and having a relatively enclosed uh, system. So that gives the government lots of flexibilities because whatever financing they need to implement uh, new initiatives, those capitals are available domestically. So you can see from the very low interest rates of the Chinese government that, that they are ample of liquidities for the Chinese government to implement its policies. Thank you. Really quick, June. Is China investable? Yeah, especially when it comes to AI or uh, manufacturing related sectors, uh, I think there's uh, still a great investment opportunity. We actually invested in China's uh, open AI called Zhupu. They recently raised 400 million from uh, Prosperity 7 here in the Middle East as well. I think that's really um, a good example of how. Uh, China can excel in these AI sectors. So there's not many foundation models uh, in other Asian countries. And China alone has more than 100. There are already six unicorn companies in foundation model. That clearly shows China has an edge over um, these engineer or you know, concentrated sectors like AI. Thank you. To wrap it up, Nicholas, back to you. Uh, even though this panel appears uh, rosier than most about China, as you know, there's a lot of skepticism around the world about China. Part of that seemed to be a lack of ability for Beijing to communicate very well about China's intentions and initiatives. Any general advice? One minute. Well, I think uh, getting the message out is tough for any government, in all honesty. We experienced that ourselves in Hong Kong. But um, Hong Kong is unique within China because we're the most international city. So I do believe that Hong Kong can play a critical role as a platform or as a super highway. Now, I'll give you one figure. Over 50% of China's FDI outflow and inflow passes through Hong Kong or into Hong Kong. So that already proves that uh, we have an important mission in our hand. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give our great minds on China and the world a big hand.